Hi, I'm Sam Solomon, the host of Signal Tower, the show where we get to talk to entrepreneurs about startups, design, and education. Today I'm joined by James LaCroix, uh, the founder of the LaCroix Design Company. They recently launched One Page Sites, which is a web design package geared towards small businesses that are on a budget and a deadline. James, welcome to the program. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about your experience working in the music industry, how you got into design, and a little bit uh, you know, about your business, uh, the LaCroix Design Company. Uh, that sounds great. <laughs> All right. Well, um, let's start the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, so I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio area. Uh, last 10 years I've been living in Nashville. And... Um, recently moved to Chicago, so we're coming up on one year in Chicago, and I've been running the Crit Design Company for about almost nine years now. All right. All right. Well, um, we're going to start with kind of a few general design topics. So, um, you know, how did you become a designer, and what did your path on the way to becoming a designer look like? Um, so this is a thing I probably, I feel like I often give talks about when I would talk to students and things. I've had this really kind of abnormal path to design, but if I would look back on it, I guess it, it's often the way I've thought about things through most of my life. So um, growing up, I didn't really know any designers. I didn't, I didn't even know this was a profession probably. <laughs> and so uh, when I was in college, I played in late high school, I played in bands all the time. And so um, at first it was just like a thing to do. And then somewhere in the middle of my college experience, I was traveling quite a bit, playing in bands. It was something I did every weekend. Um, and so I started to think maybe this could be a future. And I had some friends that growing up uh, signed a record deal. They were doing very well. And so when record labels started calling my house, I decided it was time to not go to college anymore. <laughs> and so during that whole, like in this year span, um, the band broke up. A year later, I'm working at a factory in Ohio, and I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. And at the time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I kind of started to, I used to go to bookstores, and I would grab like CMYK and print and all these wallpaper, all these basically design magazines. And I didn't know what the field was, but I just would sit and look through them, and I was like, whatever this is, this is what I want as a profession. And so. At the time, I thought that would be advertising. I, I really never knew kind of the next step. I didn't know that you might have to draw or things right. that I never grew up doing. So I ended up not doing that. And instead, I moved to Nashville and worked in the music industry um, instead. And so I originally worked in artist management for a while. And when you're young and you're new in the music industry and you work in artist management, you're pretty much at the bottom. So there wasn't a lot of money in it. There wasn't um, I guess there wasn't a lot of prestige or anything. I was often just sending contracts out or doing kind of menial tasks. And so in a weird way, it came about all of our artists we were working with, they were complaining about how their merchandise was terrible. So we, um, my boss at the time decided he was going to start a merchandise company. And early on, I saw this thing kind of start and I, I wanted to be involved in it because I saw it as more of an opportunity. So. The first thing I did was I begged him to let me start the e-commerce section. So it was the first, I guess, design project I ever project managed, but I hired a team to make a web store. And um, at the time it was my job to manage it, fulfill it. And we launched it right around a little bit before Thanksgiving. And for like one guy running this web store, I think we did $70,000 in sales between Thanksgiving and New Year's. And so it was... <laughs> kind of this crazy thing and I started, I guess that was one of the first times I started to see where the internet could make money. And um, through some restructuring of this company, uh, another young guy and I were kind of put in charge of running it and they were like, oh, you're the creative guy. You're in charge now of not the web store anymore, but you're gonna be in charge of uh, product development and um, kind of my job was to meet with artists and talk to them and talk about what their product lines would it look like and then I would hired graphic designers to kind of make them. And so I was probably the worst client ever for a graphic designer because I didn't, once again, I didn't really know how that worked. And so I would uh, send them these like napkin sketches and be like, I need you to like make this only cool. And so 
Um, they were probably overly art directed by me, but that was my kind of first. That and uh, my roommate at the time was a graphic designer, and so that was like maybe my first kind of entry into design period. So I was part of that company, um, and it turned out uh, um, a bunch of things weren't really working out for us, and we were approached by an investor to start something bigger. And so uh, at the time, we really didn't know what we were going to do. We kind of were considering going on our own as um, a couple of the people that were working together, but doing something a little different, a little bit bigger. Um, we didn't really, I didn't have funds to be able to probably invest in it on my own. And so we had an investor come and promise us a million, million and a half to um, basically launch something much bigger. So at the time, um, the company I was working at, we did, we handled product development all the way up till it was manufactured. And then we even had trucks and guys that would go out on the road and tour. And so we had this kind of full stop for music uh, merchandise. So when we were approached by this investor, we decided we were going to make this thing even bigger. We were going to bring in ticketing. Um, we were going to bring in like fan clubs. And it was at that probably time where I really started to think a lot about a brand and the things that we created and how we could build fan bases around a brand like that. Even though there are products being sold, that the more um, we targeted these products towards the people who were buying them, um, that the brand had power and it kind of progressed the band. So this whole thing happened that uh, the investor just stopped at like $100,000 and the person controlling the funds didn't really tell any of us. And so checks just kept bouncing and I knew it was, I mean, at this point I'm starting to realize something's terribly wrong and I'm wow. just hanging out in the office. Um, and as a last ditch effort, I took, I stayed in until there was basically the, the guy running it just for the most part felt bad and he let me take all my clients without a fight and I, I we had grown up really poor in Ohio and I borrowed a thousand dollars off my parents credit card to order my first blank shirts and I had this design I had done and I wasn't a designer up to this point I just I had to try it because I couldn't afford a designer and so I made this first run of shirts and I promised them I'd pay them back in 30 days or my parents back in 30 days and I did my first short shirt order and so from there, um, just because I didn't have the budget to pay designers, I became, I guess, a designer. And I started um, I started the Croy Merchandising and the Croy Design Company um, only because I didn't have time to think of a more creative name. And so I registered the businesses and started it. And we uh, didn't eat for a while, got a part ending job, and basically started making shirts for band and selling these final products. And so. Um, I guess I removed a lot of the overhead focused on the design and product design and manufacturing and that's kind of how I jumped into design. That's that's a crazy that's a crazy story. Uh, um, now doing design were you doing those shirts that was screen printing that you were doing like how are those how are you making those shirts? Uh, I was third party in it all out so I would buy um, I used to just go to printers and I realized that if I could work my own de wholesale deals on blank products right and just pay printers for printing um, that it was kind of better than just going straight to a printer and the volume I was doing I was able to bring the price down and say like if a band went straight to a printer so the band was able to come to me pay roughly about the same rate they would going straight to the printer and they would be able to get um, they would be able to have somebody foresee like the design process and then make sure it was printed well and so I was third party in all of it and it got from originally t-shirts but it got to where we were making like jackets and things overseas and like a hundred days out of making these things and having them shipped in and stuff like that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and that's a great, that's a great story. Um, so you, you never, you don't have a college degree. You never graduated. No. Um, and I kind of had the unique opportunity my last three years in Nashville to teach at a college, um, based on experience. And so that was kind of a fun, uh, having not gotten to go to school for design, it was fun to maybe step away from my client work and start to think about how you talk about design, how you think about design, um, if it's not always work-based, I guess. Right, right. Wow, that's great. Um, you, what what types of things do you find interesting? Um, I'm just a pretty curious person in general, so right. I'm always just... Um, I guess growing up, I changed when I was in college, I changed majors all the time because of this. I can never they just focus on one thing for long enough. And so I think what I find interesting about design is that there's so much that you have to 
I mean, I think just being a designer, you have to be a pretty curious person. So there's always technology stuff we're looking to do. There's always visual things we're trying to try. But then at the same time, I get to learn about everybody's business. So I'll work with a coffee company and I learn more about how coffee gets made and how it makes its way to the US and um, the people who farm coffee and what their life is like. And so um, I think what's fun about design is you get to be curious about a lot of things and it's rewarding to be able to do so. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, is there a specific philosophy in design that, that you stand by? Um, I believe it's changing. So um, when I first started, uh, I just made a lot of things. And so they were, I was primarily an illustrator for like five years. And so my only job was to put something out that looked cool. Right. And I kept doing it. And so I felt like uh, when I first started teaching and I would have to somehow translate what I had like, developed, these skills I developed, how I could talk about it. Um, initially, my first maybe year of teaching, I would just... I would throw a crazy number of projects at my students because I felt like I got good just because, or I got better just by making lots of things. Right. And so I believe that's probably changed a little bit, or actually it's changed quite a bit where I'm, I start to wonder now about, um, I guess my philosophy is I feel like as much, as much as we can have design talk, we can talk about grids or typography or all these things that we could pick apart at a restaurant menu or whatever. It ultimately comes down to we're communicating and we're having, we're creating these experiences for people. And so, um, especially us being a small shop, we don't always have time to do tons of research or whatever. I feel right. like we really try to think about the people who are using the things we create or going to interact with the logo or the booklet or the website we create. And I try to think of how we can make that experience good. It's one that they'll remember and one that, um, can be like sterile and clean and organized, but at the same time, it's going to create some emotional connection that they think about um, later on or come back to or somehow enjoy using. All right, right, yeah. Well, let's um, let's kind of go talk a little bit more about about uh, your your business. Uh, I know you touched on it a little bit a couple questions ago. Um, but so you started doing work for music artists early on. Um, how did that affect kind of how you thought about business? Um, so I think uh, for me, had I not probably come out of, been in Nashville, been in the music industry, um, I would have never thought to even start a business. So I think what's crazy about music, and especially back when there was maybe more money in the industry, is it was kind of, anyone could start a business. You would, you met the right band and you decided to manage them and you started a business. Or if you were a band, you would start a business. I mean, that's kind of what it was. And so, uh, I guess I, there's pros and cons of that. Having worked with music, uh, worked with a lot of music artists at the time, um, one of the reasons we don't much anymore is that if you're a band and you start a business, it's very easy to bankrupt that business or to just say it's over. Um, but I guess, yeah, the thing, I learned most from that is that there's opportunity and um, had I been maybe in Chicago at the time, I would have never thought that I could just jump this opportunity to start a business, but I was already of this culture that things could happen and there was potential. And if you did something right, like thing, like it would work out. And so um, maybe that's not like the best business advice, but at the time I, I felt like the environment was one that fostered uh, a, taking a chance. And so uh, we did it. and. Early on, that's um, I, we functioned, I guess, a lot like a music industry business, and we're quite different now. But um, we were very much we went to the right parties and we drank at the right places and we tried to meet the right people and we acted like we were in the music industry, even though it was uh, it was a business that I guess was designing for it. <laughs> well, so going back to to you. You've uh, been doing this for, you've had the LaCroix Design Company for nine years, but mm -hmm. you recently moved from Nashville to Chicago, right? Yes. Well, why the change and, and how has that worked out? Um, so I guess this is probably part of being the curious thing. I'm never really content doing the same thing for very long. So um, we did the illustration thing for a while on product merchandise uh, or like artist merchandise. And that eventually developed into... Um, so there's a lot of rewards with doing the merchandise part, 
as far as you could make money not based on hours, but it was on products being sold and things like that. Right. You had like a commodity. You, I had a design part of it and I had a commodity part. The problem was there's a lot of risk involved because the margins weren't very high. And so if somebody didn't pay a bit like a $5,000 invoice, it, you probably maybe only had the potential to make like $1,000 off that invoice. Uh, so there was always kind of, it was high risk versus, um, really what you could get out of it. And so we kind of started to veer away from that. And so I went from basically creating products to now creating illustrations. And so I did a lot of illustration, print work, branding. And then over the years, we've kind of moved into more of a web studio as, um, and started doing websites, web applications, which is, and, and we still do branding, but that's primarily what we're at now. Right. So I feel like it's always changing and we've always had good luck in Nashville, especially working in the music industry for a while. It was, uh, it was a great place to be. Uh, the cost of living is low. It's a wonderful city. We had like an amazing group of friends there. Uh, but eventually I kind of started to think, well, I had, I'd gotten lucky. Everything had went well. I was president of AIGA. I was teaching at a college and I didn't know what would happen in 20 years what I would do, where I would be, if there would be still something that would keep me interested. And so uh, we started to name cities that we thought would be interesting to move to. So at the time that we first thought about this, it was probably about four years ago, uh, my wife and I were in New York City and I was doing some work there. And I thought, well, what would it be like to be a like, designer in New York just to say I did it? Right. And the more and more I thought about that or San Francisco, I didn't want to be Having owned my business for a little while, I didn't want to go back to really like being broke or anything like that. So we started, and every time we'd gone to Chicago, it just felt like, it felt like how I grew up. It felt like the right city to be in. And so we moved, um, I moved up here basically to, for future potential of my business to kind of be in a bigger market, to see what that feel, what that's like and be a designer in a city. Um, it also offered like some lifestyle choices for us to not own a car or to, right. Uh, be maybe even tighter and green in our community. And so that's really kind of our reason for moving to Chicago. Yeah, no, Chicago's Chicago's a great city. Uh, I miss I miss not being able to have a car. I, I mean, even, you know, I, I've spent most of my life in Atlanta, which is the capital of the South, and you still have to have a car to get places in Atlanta. Um, I hope that changes, but uh, yeah. right now, right now it hasn't. Um, so what, you know, what kind of challenges do you run into, uh, you know, running a design company? What, you know, what would you say your biggest challenge is and you know, how do you get past it? Um, so I think we, we recently maybe addressed a couple of challenges. Uh, so I moved to Chicago to relocate to be in a bigger market. Right. And I moved up here and I worked for myself and I didn't really know very many people. And so I suddenly felt in the last, we're coming up on one year. I felt small, which was part of the reason we moved here, or I moved here, was for it to feel small again and to feel like something I had to work at. But I guess maybe that was a bigger impact than I thought it would. So um, with no one knowing us, I felt like uh, getting work in a new market was a little bit uh, tricky. And then also I realized that throughout the time of our business, so I used to sell basically artwork that was meant to like look good. It was supposed to be stunning at some point and that's like that was its only goal there's not a whole bunch of concept on it early on and then i would do even like branding and stuff where i thought there i knew there was a concept but i felt clients often were just looking for something that would look really good right and then we started doing websites and at first when it was just me i was probably pretty bad at doing some of those websites um but since now there's two of us in the studio um uh, my brother uh is kind of pretty much become my business partner but he's become quite a uh, He's a fantastic Ruby developer and awesome. handles a lot of my, even when I can't get something in JavaScript to work or whatever, he's always fixing it. So I felt like we progressed and we got better at what we did. And suddenly now being writing web applications and making really great sites, a lot of the value that we created was something you can't see. Right. And so I don't think I changed my way I was communicating my business, even though we were doing something totally different. So when we tried to quote jobs and we might cost more than someone else because we know we do it better than someone else, um, or that we're not just making a WordPress theme, that we're actually like building a pretty complex thing. We weren't right. communicating that. We would just tell them, hey, we're going to use this technology. And so I think the biggest challenge now for me was 
and we've started to really adopt this was just try to communicate what um, for people that don't see it, that don't know why this would save them money in the long run or why this would cost more, is to communicate value on something that they necessarily can't see. Um, so moving, I guess, from a commodity to now adding value to their company and speaking in business terms more than just making things look cool. Right, right. Uh, is there a specific example of that with a client that you can share with us? Um, yeah, uh, so... Uh, I guess a good example was we recently did um, redid a site for a client. Uh, this we launched it last fall, the new redesign, and so this was actually a perfect. It's one of our favorite clients to work with. Um, mainly, just they're just wonderful clients. They ask good questions. They don't always come in assuming they know the answer. Right. Uh, so they came in and they had a website and they have a ton of traffic. Um, in fact, it was the most traffic we'd seen on a website we'd worked on. And they came to us and asked specific problems. Um, a lot of times people weren't coming back to the site. Uh, they weren't um, they, they weren't coming back as much as they probably could. They had these like um, quizzes that you could take and they wanted people to take more. Right. I'm trying to remember some of the other, they, people weren't going deep enough into the site and things like that. And so we approached it and we did a redesign and in the midst of this redesign, uh, we probably didn't communicate value at the time uh, as far as what we could do behind the scenes. So we started working with this and we realized the developer that had um, given their budget, they didn't have time to redo the whole back end of the site. So we were staying with our WordPress build. And going through it, we realized that it wasn't, we were gonna have to rebuild it anyway. Nothing was set up correctly. Um, so we did this and we, we probably didn't even communicate value on that. But we launched this new site and it's become a lot more popular. Um, well, I mean, the site was already popular, but I think people are coming back, more people right. are taking these quizzes. They're now having, um, because of how many people taking these quizzes, uh, these quizzes were built into the WordPress uh, database. And so things were slowing down quite a bit because it was never meant to handle being hit like every minute or anything right. like that. Uh, so I felt like that was a good time for us. We've been talking about this value price and trying to do it better or, or communicating value. And I was able to come in and not talk about, well, we're gonna build this Ruby application that can now be embedded and that has an API and can be all this thing. We were able to come in and talk about um, part of your problem was that this site was never set up to become bigger than what it was. And so we have to now kind of come back and when, the difference is the reason you're gonna pay more for this is that we're creating something that now can kind of expand. Um, I mean, obviously it'll be a Ruby thing. It's not infinitely expansive, but it'll be totally fine for what they're doing for a long time and it can handle way more workload than what they're built. And so I think that's one of the, I guess a way that we're always trying to talk to clients is that we're trying to give them something that um, not only fits their needs now, that is ultimately going to be scalable at some point in time that um, next time they want to redesign it, we don't have to scrap the whole thing. Uh, so there's not like a lot of technical, we try not to use the word technical debt, but we try to, in a nice way, say that over time this will save you money if you can right. pay a little bit more at the front end and let's do this right the first time. So that was something we never talked about. We just did it. And then we were like, I don't understand why these people don't appreciate everything we do. And so <laughs> we've, we've tried to talk more uh, openly about what makes our process a little bit better. Right. Yeah. I think communicating value to clients is probably one of the most important things you can do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, do you have a project over the years that, uh, you know, is your, that you'd say is your favorite or, or one that you're the most proud of? Um, actually it's this one. So it's this five love languages site. Right. And, um, I think we've had a lot of sites that we've enjoyed. I feel most of the time we've gotten really lucky. We like working with our clients. We always, right. A lot of times they end up becoming friends or they were friends or um, we have regular conversations. So there's a lot of great projects, but that one was one that was really special because um, us being a small studio of two people, we didn't, we didn't do a ton, we, we can't do a ton of eye testing or eye tracking right. and AB testing. We didn't do a lot of that. So we just, we looked at the problem and we thought about, and it was funny because it wasn't necessarily a site we'd go to all the time or anything like that, but we thought about how people might want to use it and we really uh, thought about the experience we could create. And they also have the traffic so that we were immediately able to see results. Um, and we can see results on everything. Um, even um, my brother is always watching the way the server is handling things and right. looking for ways to optimize that. And it, that's a luxury we don't get with all our projects. So we have projects that maybe get a thousand people a day, but when you're starting to get 
um, like a few hundred thousand people a month or whatever visiting the site. It's kind of fun to watch that and see how these things that you thought somebody would use are actually using them. And it's really exciting to watch that happen. Right. So I guess we always enjoy that project. Just As kind of a, a side note, what are you guys using? To, what, or what, what are they using to watch that? Are they using KISS metrics or Google Analytics or is there... Yeah, we always set up a couple. Or probably our two favorites we use mainly because the cost of Google Analytics is fantastic. Right. We always uh, we use that. Gauges is fun for like a short glimpse, of, especially when you launch or you put something new out there. It's always kind of fun to just flip it on. Or and there's an iPhone app, so if I go out to dinner or something like that, I can make a quick glance on who's popping on the site and where they're looking and things like that. Right. Right. Cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, one-page sites. Um, that is y'all's package service that gives small businesses website that uh, quickly and affordably. Uh, will, you, will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the more and more, I guess this was also as we're addressing communicating value. Um, we realized that a lot of people don't know how to shop for a website. and. It's probably more designers than clients that have done a poor job of communicating how this is done. And maybe, for the most part, maybe the design industry or the web industry as a whole has quite... There's so many options, we haven't even quite figured out the best way to always do this. Right. But um, often people call and they ask for a website and they... We started kind of charting the different things people will say. They'll say, well, I need a five-page website. Or somebody will say, um, I need a website that looks like this. And they already have this picture in their head of some other company's website, and they're not even sure if that works for the other company. Um, but they're always people like clients are always really actually creative on trying to figure out how to approach hiring somebody to do a website. And normally that comes back with us asking a bunch of questions. Normally we're now we're trying to change it about how their business runs. We're we're looking for an opportunity to um, turn this whatever this website cost is into an investment for them, and hopefully make them more money off of it. Um, and so this is back and forth, and I feel like most of the time on bigger projects, that's a great way to do it. We have an right. ongoing discussion. We'll eventually maybe hop on the phone and have kind of a overall phone meeting. We'll start to draw this, put in all these details, throw ideas out until it eventually becomes a proposal, uh, which is great when you have a large project. Um, but at the same time, I feel like sometimes somebody just needs something quick and short in this process maybe scares them and they just wanted to hop in and maybe be, know exactly what to do. Or the other thing we we're starting to launch is people just ask for things thinking they need them. So they'll ask for a content management system or whatever. And then they'll never touch it. They just thought yeah, it was I'm... the thing they needed. So they spent a few thousand dollars extra to build in this piece that they were never going to use. And right. if they were just changing a couple of lines of copy, they'd probably just be better off calling us back up. I mean, like, hey, can you change this? Yeah. And we would immediately... I mean, sometimes if it's quicker to change it than invoice it, we just change it. Um, so uh, we, we thought there might be an answer for that on a low level. Um, so we created one page sites and one page sites is uh, it's basically a long one page site that's broken down into sections that we offer for uh, $3,000 and it's done in three weeks. And so what it's nice about it is it takes a lot of questions out of it if you're wondering how long it'll take or if you need something in three weeks and this is, might be a perfect setup if your budget's about three thousand dollars then you might want to direct your project in a way so that it fits into this model um, and so yeah we created that it gives people great looking sites they're responsive so they'll work on tablets mobile uh, tablets phone other mobile devices but it basically takes a lot of the gray areas out so if your project's more complex than that we can go through the lots of questions the back and forth finding um, out the best way to integrate your email marketing campaign or all these things that you might right. want to do. Uh, but if it fits into one page sites, then we can just immediately dive in and think about content and the best way to um, deliver this in a one page section that is very actionable and brings people into your restaurant or get someone to buy your product or subscribe to your service or whatever it's going to be. Right. Yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of of uh, one page websites just in general. I've built a few of them and really it's a, I mean, it's a great solution for small businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like you said, I've had that before where, you know, they want this thing where they can go in and change it themselves and they don't know how to do it and won't ever do it. And it's just a, you know, it's not, it's not worth it really for them to build, to have something built into WordPress when it's, you know, just changing a few things in the HTML. Um, Absolutely. So I, I definitely understand that. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, you know, kind of the advantages for you guys, you know, uh, building one paid site, um, you know, what, what, what types, how does that benefit you? Um, so there's a f several reasons we also did this and it kind of, as much as it answers maybe some questions for a client, it starts to maybe answer some questions even about what it's like working with the credit design company. So, um, it gives us, candidly, it gives us maybe a base price level for a website and a base expectation. So the idea is we felt bad because sometimes we would have these conversations back and forth, back and forth, and um, we didn't talk about price early enough. And so weeks go by and we've talked about this and we're excited about it, we're invested. And then we find out that they don't have the money to really accomplish this. And then so all of a sudden we're, we're working backwards and trying to figure out how we can get something into their budget. So for us, it gives a nice ballpark if somebody's coming to, if thinking about hiring us or whatever, they can look at this and be like, well, if I need more than this, it's probably going to cost more. If I need it faster than this, it's probably going to cost more. Or maybe my, my expectations are a little unrealistic if I need this thing up in a week or something like that. So right. uh, for us, it kind of gives us a ballpark level of expectations. And it shows um, for those that are looking to hire us, um, it gives them kind of a nice um, way to come in at an early level and work with us. And not be maybe scared by an initial price so we can create something great for them and it starts off with that so that, i guess for us it allows us to kind of set an expectation level early on uh, of what it would be like to work with the credit design company great well so what you know i guess where do you take one page sites from here you know what kind of future plans do you guys have um so we haven't done any advertising for the most part on it so that'll be the next step um we're eventually going to look at um, buying some Google ads and things like that um, and just starting to market a little bit better. We kind of put it out there and let the momentum just happen so far and we've got <laughs> some sites off of it. Uh, eventually we want to start to look at um, other modules that we can add to it so that you could do like a one page site and a blog and that add on would cost a fl we don't want to, we can't flat rate everything we do, but we're trying to think of very distinct things that people might need right. and come up with flat rates for them that we can create something that they know the expectation, they know the cost, and then um, we can maybe work, we can then work with them to help it make it uh, a financial value for them. So um, that's kind of the next thing is to eventually start to add what's a blog package look like, what's a basic content management system package look like. But more importantly, we're looking at packaging more of our services. So um, we're even looking at packaging some reoccurring things where we would help somebody monitor and get the most out of their site and things like that. So I guess it's more somewhat one page sites we want to grow. But at the same time, we like this model of setting expectations early and allow somebody to have this like package service that they can utilize. There's not a bunch of questions. They don't know. There's Right. Um, this is what you're getting. Person. This yeah. is I, I really I mean I actually that like one of my favorite parts I'm I'm on a one page sites dot net right now and it's like this is what's this is what you're gonna get and this is what you're not gonna get. You know, mm -hmm. we're not gonna do, you know, you know, copywriting, things like that. Um, but you will get this great looking website that's responsive and I, I think that, you know, for me I'm really, really big on, on copywriting and how things are written. And um, that's actually like I think one of my favorite part of the sites. I think you guys have done an excellent job of of communicating uh, the value and uh, your expectations. So, um, and that's I think one of the things I really like about one page sites just for businesses is that it forces you to write very directive. So websites in general are kind of like a choose your own adventure for the most part. And there's different pages. Somebody goes from one page to the other. And um, I guess a lot of companies think that that's what somebody wants. Um, but sometimes if you're just you have a very direct product or a very direct service, uh, say you're a restaurant, people really need to know if you're open, do they need to have a reservation or whatever, what your menu is and how to get there. Yeah. So it's very direct. And so um, what we like about one page sites is it forces you to write very direct copy. So um, we value copywriting a lot. We don't offer it included in that service, but we will sit with those clients early on and try to look at what they might want to say and coach them and look at, and basically coach them into some very actionable language that somebody can look at and get the one page site. So for in the minute they're on that home page, they can make an informed decision on whether or not they want to buy that product or 
do whatever action conversion right. you're trying to get out of it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's um, let's go ahead. We're running out of time here. Um, so let's let's. I want, kind of want to jump into kind of a few kind of last few questions. Okay. Uh, if you weren't a designer, what would you be doing right now? Uh, if I wasn't a designer, um, I feel like. That's always tough because design is such a part of everything, the way I think about the world or whatever. Um, early on when I was younger, I wanted to be an architect. Uh, well, I was told I was good at math and everybody said you either become like an architect or an engineer or accountant. So I tried to take this architecture class in high school. And to get to that, I had to take this mechanical drawing class. And I was, I was awful. I had terrible handwriting. So I was terrible at this mechanical drawing class. So I decided that wasn't for me. And, I didn't do it. Um, so architecture is always something that interests me. But I guess at some point I would, I'm still fascinated by business. And so I'd like to, I guess maybe have some more traditional business role or um, I guess I'm not, uh, I have a brother that's an accountant and he's very organized and deliberate all the time. And I'm maybe not like that, but I, I feel like I'd want to do something where it was some creative way of running a business or um, building culture in some way, I guess. Right. Yeah. No. I, I understand. Actually, at one point, one point, I wanted to be an architect as well. So, yeah. um, yeah, that was part of the reason I I, cho I, I chose Auburn for college because uh, Auburn's got a great architecture school. But when I got there, it was I, I just for whatever reason decided I needed to go do something else. And then I also jumped around majors for like most of my college career. Um, you know, what would you say to someone who's uh, starting in design, who's an aspiring designer? You know, where should they start? Um, it's always tough because uh, I guess it's more trying to figure out what you want to get out of it. Because uh, school in some circles is a really great way to become a designer. If, so if you're young enough and you're looking to go to college for design, school's great uh, as long as you understand what it is. And I think um, a lot of design students don't embrace so I had to learn kind of on the go. And I guess as designers, you're always still learning as you're going. Right. And we make mistakes and it goes out in the world. And hopefully if it's a big mistake, not too many people catch it. Sometimes it costs you money, whatever. But I think college is a great way to have four years of just exploring visual ideas. So that's an option. But then I guess if you want to work faster than that, um, or if you're looking to do web design, I think you just start doing it. Uh, so I mentor, there's this... Uh, uh, well, starter league here in Chicago. I'm a mentor there, and often I tell the students, they're like, I don't know what I do after this class. And it's like, I think you just make as many things as you can. You so your friend's garage sale, make a website for it, or all like, I think it's just a matter of doing. We get sometimes so scared to, I guess, do something that we spend our whole life just thinking about it. And design, you just got to try it and make some ugly things, and eventually they're going to look better. So, Absolutely. I guess that's always the thing I tell people is just start doing it. I think that's fantastic. I think that is fantastic advice. Um, now, what about what about books? Are there specific design books that every designer should read? Um, I, I tell almost everybody the elements of typographic style. I think that's uh, it's it's sitting on not, my shelf over there. <laughs> that's yeah, a good it's not one. The most uh, you might want to have a couple cups of coffee before you dive into it. Uh, but I think it's just, it's something I read about every two years and I go back and I realize I forgot something or that I'm using an M dash wrong or like, it sounds like silly stuff, but it's stuff that when you realize you've been doing it and you're a professional and you're not always doing it exact, it's nice to be reminded. So that's a good one. Um, I'm obsessed with design books. So early on, uh, I was scared because so I was a college dropout and like things didn't go so well. And then I started my business and I tried to go back to school for design at the time and the business took off. So I bought all these, uh, there's, this, there's this website, you work for them, and they used to have a book list. And I pretty much bought every book on this book list. So I had a bunch of like Mueller Brockman grid system books and all these old German typography books. And I read them all cover to cover. And I, I, and I went through this whole thing. And so I guess I'm always recommending books, but I tend to look at specifically what somebody wants to learn. But right. overall, I think every designer should read elements of typographic style. Right. And I think for me, there's there's a few books that I go back and I read every year, just you know, just like what you were talking about. And I think there's not many books that I do, but um, like On Writing Well, 
that is like for writing i think that is like that's like the the bible of writing of writing nonfiction. and uh, obviously with this blog i do a good amount of writing but every year uh, you know i go back and and i and i always feel like i'm reminded of something or you know you know there's there's something i missed the first time that you know i, I can pick up so i think the you know, that's a great recommendation and you know books that you can reread once a year and still learn something new every time you uh you open it. it's great mm -hmm. um, i think i'm gonna have to pick up that book I yeah my goal this year has been to become a better writer so on writing well i'm serious if, i mean that's like so my book that i recommend everybody everybody watching the show pick up on writing well um it is, you know, it's it's not a very long book, but I mean, if if you want to, you know, start writing on a blog or anything, um, there's just so many good, like, pieces of information about writing concisely, um, about leaving every, you know, every piece, good piece of nonfiction should leave should leave the reader with one specific thought, uh, you know, just things like that. Um, I, I highly recommend. I didn't mean to steal your question there, but. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, well, so do you have any closing comments? Are there any questions in this interview that I should have asked you? You know about you know stories you need to tell, uh, things about you know one-page sites, uh, Lacroix design. Um, not I. I think we covered most of it. Um, I feel like often we tell people about how we got here and the way we tend to think about things, and I feel like we covered a lot of that. Oh, good, good. Any other, any last comments or anything? Um, no, I feel like uh, it's just um, here any, I think it's just a matter of uh, we enjoy what we do and we're happy to get out and do it. And we hope that if anyone else is looking to do design or whatever, you just, you make things and you put them up there. And I guess one page sites is an exact example of that. We had this idea and I spent a week making a website and we both of us did. And putting it out there and trying it. And it's now an idea that I think interests people and has given somebody a new look in the way we operate, so. Absolutely. Well, so James, where can people follow you? Um, so I'm on Twitter quite a bit at, at LaCroix Design, or at, at LaCroix Design, and uh, our website is LaCroixDesign.net. We regularly put up new projects. Uh, we've been trying to blog more regularly and write about uh, uh, we've changed a lot of, I used to just maybe blog about designer things, but I've really been trying to blog about things that might help a website improve. Uh, OnePageSites.net is a great way to check out that, uh, or I mean, what we're doing with that. And I feel we're, we're active on a lot of social networks, so I'm on, I'm Joe LaCroix Design and everything like that, so. Oh, great. Well, James, thanks, thanks for doing the show today. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely.